Uh, First John actually takes a little bit more uh, understanding. It is a legal argument. Like all legal arguments, you have to look closely at definitions. We did this back in Leviticus, and it could be, am I, is my uh, sound on? It could be that in legal arguments you've forgotten, but the issue of legal arguments is that when you read a law, let's say a law in the state of Florida, if it's a 10-page law, four pages of that law are definitions. The last four pages will just say, when we say man, we mean this. When we say dog, we mean this. When we say car, we mean this. When we say roadway, we mean this kind of roadway, not this kind or this kind or this kind. When we say light, we mean this. When we say red, we mean this. And seriously, the last four pages of of a 10-page law, 40% of a law often is definitions. Why? Because somebody will say, well, it says roadway, but it doesn't, does that mean gravel or does that mean macadam? Is it blacktop or not? Is it a single lane or double lane? This was only a single lane, so that doesn't apply. And some judge sitting on some bench will look at the law and say it's ambiguous and throw it out. So if they want the law to work, they have to be very specific. Now, when I'm talking about the New Testament, I want to be careful not to make it sound like such legal language that it's not in an atmosphere. I want you to think that 1 John is not giving you the rules to get into the club, Club Jesus. Okay, I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative way, or in a negative way. What he's saying is when you're part of the body of Christ, there are certain things you need to understand about who we are and how we think and what we do. What do we know about John, the writer? We know he's the brother of James and the son of Zebedee. He grew up in Capernaum in Galilee, and some of you are going to be there shortly. He was one of the fishermen that was called by Jesus to become fishers of men early on. Peter and Andrew worked for his father's fishing business. So it is the Zebedee and Sons Fishing Company Incorporated, and John and James are the sons. Zebedee, John, James, add on to that Peter and Andrew, and you've got your Zebedee and Sons Fishing Company Incorporated. He's likely the youngest of the disciples. And that's important because he outlasts all the other disciples and ends up writing the last of the books from the New Testament collection, which is the book of Revelation. Um, He is called in John's gospel simply the title, the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, I'm pretty sure Jesus loved the other ones too. But what he's doing is he's, he's writing about himself without mentioning his name, which was considered respectful. And so when you see that, What do you know about his character? James and John were called something that should tell you something about them. What were they called? Sons of thunder. Just hear the word big mouth, okay? Um, They they had anger issues, perhaps. They're the people that will tell Jesus uh, when he comes through Samaria late in the ministry, why don't you call down fire from heaven and make those Samaritans toast? They're prejudiced and they're big mouthed. And they have some issues. He's, of course, the last surviving apostle, and he dies probably well into his 80s, maybe even as late as his 90th year of life. So he lives a lot longer than the rest of the guys. For 2 John, he's simply referred to as the elder. So make a note that the elder is John in the letter. He's an elder statesman of the church. And... um, It can be a word, presbyteros can be a word for an elder of the church, or it can be a word for an old man. And so it's it's exactly the same word. It's often used for respected leaders in a synagogue, and then later gets used by respected leaders in a church. He was also the only apostle to die of natural causes, as far as we know. John is the only apostle, and it's not because they didn't try to kill him. Apparently they attempted to boil him in oil, but he didn't boil They sent him to Patmos, and all he did was got revelation, and so it wasn't working out. When you try to punish John, he comes out with a new book, okay? It's probably better to just let him die of natural causes. It's Jerome who tells us that the last words of John before he dies, when he was dying, was, little children love one another. And he kept repeating that as he lay in his bed dying. And when they said to him, the the believers do love one one another, he said, it is enough. It is the Lord's command. Those are the last words of John as we have them. 
All right, there are four boxes for this. The first one is 1, 1 to 2, 14. And we're going to talk about that one next. And that is all about talkers. The second box is 215 to 29. And the box literally deals with defectors. These are people who are leaving the ministry. People who once said they were part of the faith but are gone from the faith. Then there's a box for chapter 3. And these are imposters. This sounds like such a nice lineup of people, you know. Imposters. And then 4 and 5 are going to be false teachers. That means John's letter is perhaps one of the more negative letters in the New Testament. Don't let that bring you down. He's dealing with a certain set of problems. People are coming in. He's the, he's the big love guy. Love, love, love. And they're coming in and they're beating him over the head with acceptance and tolerance that is inappropriate. And so he's got to step up and say, when I said love, I think you didn't understand what I meant. I didn't mean free for all. I didn't mean Woodstock and let's all go out on a hillside. That's not, that's not what I was talking about. Now, I want you to start off with things people say. And the reason I say this is in verse, in chapter 1, 1 through 2, 11, uh, I'm sorry, through 2, 14, there is a, there's a whole, uh, exhibition of people who talk you're going to see a phrase over and over and over of, that people say or one says it's things people say as opposed to things people do okay so if you take a look at verses one to four it says what was from the beginning what we have heard what we have seen with our eyes what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write, so that your joy may be made complete. This is one of the most complex sentences you will ever read. This is a complex sentence structure that goes, doubles back on itself several times. But if you cut through it, what he literally says is our work is all about Jesus. Everything we've been telling you is about Jesus. And we invite you to understand who Jesus is and you will find joy in that. Our message is about the one that we saw, handled, touched, were walked with, laughed with, spent time with. Jesus, 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 Jesus. So our work is all about Jesus. From the beginning, we heard vocally, we saw him physically, we handled him personally. The actual word of life, the life giver is the real life and he reveals real life. His life was made known and we shared it openly. We preached the eternal life that the Father shared with us. We taught you that you would have a solid relationship with God. We write now to complete this work so that you can have this full commitment and in that commitment you must Choose a side that will bring you joy. That's the whole idea. Now verse 5 says this. This is the message we heard from him and announced to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Wait a minute. This sounds different than what it is. It sounds like he's talking about walking into a dark room. It sounds like he's talking about a light bulb. He's not. He's trying to say there's truth and there's error and they're not mixed. He's trying to say this is high contrast, right and wrong, not shades of gray. He's trying to say to them there is a binary state, yes, no, off, on. And walking with God is not all shadows. Why? Because the number one thing people do in order to avoid the, the, the truth is add complexity so that they can get high contrast to become shadows. Well, it's kind of not always wrong because there's some situations where it might kind of be somewhat right. And what they're doing is softening the edges and he says, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Meaning, 
in moral, there's moral certitude and moral exactitude. There's moral certitude and moral exactitude. That is, you can know what's right and you can know what's wrong. Now, the problem is imitation followers. So next to verse 6, problem, colon, imitation followers. These are talkers, but not livers. So contestant number one, we bring to you, verse 6. If we say, circle if we say, if we say, circle in verse 8, if we say, in verse 9, if we confess, verse 10, if we say, do you get the idea that he's talking about talkers? If we say, if we proclaim, if we express, if we confess, these are things people say. Okay, contestant number one. In verse 6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light and we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So contestant number one, some people say they're fellowshipping with Jesus, but they're not walking according to the light. In fact, they're walking according to the dark world, so they can't be telling the truth. Verse 6 says, some people say they're walking with him, but they're walking in darkness. That can't be true. In other words, it is possible to measure whether a person is acting as a Christian. That's what verse 6 says. It is possible to measure whether someone is acting as a Christian. Does that mean in every circumstance? No, but in general, if a person is walking in darkness, they're not walking in light. This isn't, uh, this isn't rocket science, okay? So he's trying to say the distinction principle. What is the distinction principle? There must be a noticeable distinction between the world's values and the believers or that person's lying about being a believer. When somebody gets up and says, I, you know I'm a Christian because I go to church. No, I know you're a Christian if you follow Jesus. Now, go to verse 8. Let me give you a second case. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay, in verse 8, some people say they don't sin. That's self-deception. They're just fine. But God provided in verse 9 a very famous verse. Verse 9, he provided a way to deal with sin in the believer's life. So there's a, no need to pretend that we're sinless because it isn't true and it makes him a liar and shows that we never had a walk with him. That's what verse 10 says. If you try to make out that you're not a sinner, then God must be lying. Okay, this is what I would call the pride principle. What is the pride principle? Verses nine, ten, uh, verse 8, 9, 10. When we try to hide that we have sinned, we block God's future use of our lives and we kill grace's growth in us. Don't hide who you are. Bring who you are to an all-knowing Savior. Don't hide it. Go down and keep reading. It says... Verse 1, my little children, I'm in chapter 2. Verse 1, my little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation is satisfaction. He is the satisfaction for our sins. It's a legal term. It means the debt is paid and therefore satisfies. It does not mean you didn't sin. It means you did. It does not mean you're not guilty. It means you are. It means somebody paid for the penalty of the sin. Okay? And then it says, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Now, circle the one who says in verse 4. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. The true, uh, uh, but, but whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. In verse 6, again, circle one who says. If you say you belong to him, you should abide in what he does. You should walk like this. Okay, so here's the third case. The second case was people who said they don't sin at the end of chapter 1. The third case is some people say in verse 4 that they know him, but they walk like they don't. People ask this all the time. If a person doesn't walk like a believer, are they a believer? 
And here's what he says. Obedience is the prerequisite for being completed in his love. In other words, you're not a mature one for sure. You're not complete in him for sure. This is the practice principle, and it's this. What we truly believe comes out in our lives. It's not what we say in Sunday in church. It's what we live in Monday morning. That's the real us. When you are under pressure, when you are upset, when you are tired, what comes out of your mouth is the real you. When you are not tired and not under pressure, that's the you buried deeply, covered over by adornment. That's you with makeup. It's not the real you. The real you comes out when pressure's on. So, you know, here's the thing. It's, it's very possible that people will walk around saying. Now, in verse 4, if I say that I know him, but I don't keep the commandments, how can I say I know him? Well, wait a minute. Remember, if 1 John is read in, its, in the context of the rest of life without its self-defining terms, this sounds like Christians are perfect, doesn't it? Christians are not perfect. So, what is he saying? Whoever keeps his word... In him, the love of God has truly been perfected. He's saying that as you, in verse 5, as you keep his word, there's a completion or a maturing of your life. So you become completed and mature by keeping his word. It's not your ability to speak truth. It's your ability to live truth. Now, he says in verse 7, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which, was, which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. What's he talking about? I, I'm not telling you something new, but I guess I am telling you something new because the light is beginning to shine brighter and brighter and the darkness is getting dimmer and dimmer. Is he talking about in the world? Does anybody believe that darkness is getting overtaken by light in the world? Do you think at the time of, say, Nero that was true? Or the time of Vespasian or Domitian that was true? No. So who or what is having light take over? In the context of what he just said, who or what is getting light taking, taking over? The maturing believer. So he says, in a way I'm asking you to do something new because as you grow, light is displacing darkness. Don't miss verse 8. It's a huge principle for believers. How do I grow up in him? I stop pouring in darkness. It's the old... I mean, how many youth pastors have used this? You bring dirt, you put dirt, a couple of teaspoons of dirt in a cup. Just put it in a cup. How do you get the dirt out of the cup without moving the cup? Well, the easiest way to do it is pour water in the cup until it displaces the dirt. In other words, how do I get the darkness out of my life? I pour light into it until it displaces the darkness. And this principle is, as I grow up, more of what Jesus said will be abundant in me. Colossians says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all things. As I allow the word to, to water in, the dirt goes out. Now, it's not perfect. It's not bacteriologically perfect. But it's getting better. It's getting cleaner. I can't extract the dirt that's there, but I can add light. I can't get rid of the darkness. It's already in my heart. But I can add more and more light, and the darkness is dispelled by the light. And by the way, light always wins over darkness every time. There is no such thing as a, as a, a flash dark that goes out, you turn it on, and it cancels and make dark where it's light. There's not a flash dark. We have flashlights because the light conquers darkness. That's what it does. Verse 9. The one who says he is light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. Now he's playing on a specific aspect of light and dark. And what is that specific aspect in verse 9? The way he treats his brother. So what is one of the symptoms of darkness in believers' lives? Leftover darkness shows in believers how, according to verse 9. 
Yeah, there's, there's strife, hatred, anger. Division is a symbol of darkness in the letter. So, let me say it this way. As you grow in light, what would be the converse truth that would happen to you? Unity. Unity would be the property of light. Division would be the property of darkness. I have watched this happen. Satan lobs darkness bombs in churches and divides people. He divides them. He divides them. And where people are at each other's throat, that's not the work of God. It's, it's, that's not. That's not what he's doing. So the one who loves his brother abides in light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. He's playing on the idea of light and darkness, and he's saying other people can follow those who walk in light and without stumbling. If you follow, if you go into a dark room after somebody shut the light off and brought in darkness, you will trip over what's on the floor. But if they walk in and turn the light on, bring the light into the room, then those following them know where to walk. The one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He's now playing with the darkness, not only being something that goes behind us, but something that goes in front of us. Hatred will blind you to where you're going. If you become the divide, divisive Christian, the one who is causing the division, you will blind the future of that ministry. All you have to do is divide people and be used of the enemy to bring in darkness and that ministry will come to a stop because people don't know which way to go. Where there's confusion and darkness, there's a lack of direction. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I want you to look now at verse, uh, verses 12 through 14. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his namesake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I've written to you, children, because you know the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. The thing you need to ask is he's talking about people who are divided. He's talking about people who are talking one way, living another way, causing division among them. And then he goes into this litany where he's repeating himself. Do you see it? Okay. Can anybody tell me? Here's, here's what I would do. I would circle in verse 12, children. Then circle in verse 13, children, and draw a line between them. Then I would circle in verse 13, fathers, and circle in verse 14, fathers, not the capital father, but fathers in verse 14, and I would link the two of those together, draw a line between them. Then I would do young men in verse 13, circle thir young men, then circle it again in 14 and draw a line between them. So he's writing to three groups of people, people who are saved, people who are leaders, and people who are young but growing that are aggressively abiding in the word. And he says, I need you guys. So, so here's the problem. Who do you think the problem was between those three groups? That's what I'm trying to say. What he does is the fathers and the young men are having trouble and the children aren't getting along with the, uh, with the other. There's three groups in the church and he, spe he specifies the three and he says each of you brings something to the table. That's what he's trying to tell them. So here's the problem with talkers. There's people that say all kinds of things, but you can't take it based on what they say. What do you have to do? You have to take it based on what they do. Now, there is a difference between light and darkness, and the biggest difference is where there's darkness, there's division. Where there's light, there's unity. I wrote to the three groups of people that are having trouble getting together. Each of you brings something to the table. You need to see the value in one another. That's the idea of the box. Does everybody get it? We can now jump to the second box because it's only 15 to 29. Let me make this very practical and maybe come at it this way. The guy comes to Christ in a Bible study that you're leading. He's walking with Jesus for a number of months. 
He's really hot on learning his Bible. There are some marks in his life that seem like he's really changing. But over time, about six months later, you find that he's, um, his attitudes about life, his old habits begin creeping back in. And slowly, there's a coolness that settles over his heart in terms of his relationship with God. And um, then he starts missing Bible studies and he's absenting himself from being around believers and his, his involvement diminishes to zero. And uh, six months later, it seemed like maybe his whole Jesus thing was a phase, like he was just going through a phase. Did he really know Jesus? Um, why didn't he stay with his new life if he had new life? Um, verse, go, to, go to verse 15 and understand this. Verse 15 says, we must understand there's a choice. Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What he's saying is there are two directions to somebody, with somebody who's encountered the gospel that they can go. If they place the fulfillment of needs in this life, the physical life, as more important, that will determine their path. Verses 16 through 18, there's a second principle. The first one is you have to understand the choice. The second one is this. You have to understand the consequences of the choice. So the choice is presented in 15, the consequences in 16 through 18. In 16, all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. What he's saying is when I talk about world, what I mean is the fallen world system, which is defined by... Um, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and boastful pride of life. That's the definition of world. When he says, love not the world, he doesn't mean don't love lost people. He means love not the system of fallen men that is focused on the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and boastful pride of life. It is self-defining. Okay? What, the world is passing away. What world is passing away? The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and boastful pride of life. The, the sinful, fallen, broken world is passing away. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Meaning, the one who is focused on world 1.0, the spiritual world, is already focused on the eternal world, not the temporal one. The temporal one is temporal. It falls apart. It doesn't last. And then in verse 18, children, it's late in the game. And there's a rising tide of anti-Christian thinking, anti-Christ thinking. And that should tell you there's not a lot of time in the game. So one of the symptoms of a person who sees this life as more important is they think there's time to deal with eternal things later. The person who has eternal things as their most important thing thinks we're running out of time. So... The spiritually mature person will not believe there's a lot of time left. The spiritually immature person will say, we can deal with that later. There's lots of time to deal with that. And they will put off eternity in the now. Okay? Now, stop and look then at the problems that arise. Because a couple of problems arise. The first problem that is obvious is what we saw in 16, 17 is that their option won't last. Okay, if you put your hope in this world, it won't last. So let's just pick that out as an option and a problem. But there's another problem in verse 18. The choice is urgent. We're running out of time. The battle for your heart has to end soon. So he's saying you can't win against the rising battle if you don't choose a side. There's sides forming, antichrist and Christ. You got to choose a side. You don't get to walk the fence. Because lots of people want to be believers, sort of, but not too profoundly believers that anybody would know. Now, verse 19, here's, here's a, a, another thing that happens. We have to recognize that some people are going to fall away, but you can't see their hearts at all. Look at verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us but they went out so that, it would not, so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. As time gets later, he's, during, he's writing this during a persecution. The Domitian persecution was a terrible time. He's writing this during a time where as the persecution is ratcheting up, some people are dropping away. And so what does he say specifically about the people who are defecting during this time? 
They went out from us. If they were part of us, they would have remained. They weren't. But the pressure that came on them helped clean out who was really with us and who really wasn't. Okay? He's not trying to decide whether the person it, it, it left was truly saved. He's trying to say they have shown themselves to not be part of us. He's not making a judgment about their souls. They are. They're saying, I don't want to be one of those. Okay? You can't Never, 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 never sit down with your friend who's walking completely away from the Lord and say, Johnny, I was there when you came to know Jesus. Surely you're a believer. Don't you dare do that. The Bible doesn't. The Bible doesn't try to shove once saved, always saved down the throat of a person who doesn't want to walk with God. That is not true. You find me the passage that does that. What the Bible does it says, if you will not grow, 2 Peter 1, you've forgotten you were saved from your sins. Not that you weren't, but you won't remember it. And God will not give you assurance of your faith if you won't walk with him. Do not give assurance to people who want to live disobediently because you are fighting what the Spirit of God is doing. They are disrupted because that's how you get people to stop doing. The other thing is we needn't allow the de their defection to rock our commitment. Look at verses 20 and 21. Their defection doesn't need to rock our commitment. Verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you know that you do. Don't tell me... If you know that Jesus is your Savior, you know that you know Jesus as your Savior. So if somebody's sitting there looking at me going, I'm just so uncertain about my salvation, my first question is, what's the sin you're harboring? Because if you're walking with God, you're not walking around going, I wonder if I'm walking with God. I, honestly, it's like people walk around like it's a big mystery. Verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Again, he's making, he's, try, he's doing light, darkness, lie, truth, binary state. We're in persecution. Stop saying you're one of us, but you don't show up at the meeting. Stop saying that you love Jesus, but you act like a pagan. Stop. If you want to live both lives, you can't. It's time for you to choose. And then verse 21 he says, I know that you know. And he said, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Father does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which, was, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. He says, look. You don't have to allow their defection to rock you. What we will need to do to choose a voice to follow, and there are people that say we know the Father but not the Son. Who are they, by the way? Who are the people that say we know the Father but not the Son? Jews. He says there, there are going to be some people who will say, well, we know the Father but not the Son. Listen, you need to know which voice to follow. Mature believers have to understand their responsibilities we have in relating to the struggles of younger followers. And so he sets it up and he says, you need to know who to follow and what voices to follow. And then verse 25, he goes on and says, this is the promise which he himself made to us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it, is taught, it was, has taught you, abide in him. Little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame. He said, Jesus is coming back, and people who aren't walking with him don't like hearing that. And people who are walking with him can't wait. What, what is your response? If Jesus comes today, what is your response? Are you looking forward to an inspection on your life? Or do you really need another week to get a few things together? That's what he's saying. And listen, if you're in the category of I need another week to get things together, you're like most believers. He's saying, get it together, because it might be today. We're running out of time. And he's trying to be very directive with them. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that there are people defecting. And in verse 20, 26, he needed to warn them. In verse 27, he tried to encourage them. You have an anointing. Let me just say it this way. 
the Spirit of God within you can deal with a lot of the problems around you. And so if you'll stop and consult the Spirit of God and the Word of God, you will find that He will answer most things without external assistance. In a time when the church imitates the world and the world the church, it's hard to see a biblical set of contrasts. And what John is doing is he's offering a stunning contrast of us and them. If there is an us and them in the Bible, it is in chapter 3. It's also very difficult if you do not understand self-defining terms. Chapter 3, if I were going to try to teach it, I would draw a line in the center and put us and them, or not yet believers and already believers, okay? Because he's going to jump between the two. And if you don't know what he's doing, you're going to get frustrated because it's not like Paul where you outline, let me tell you about us and we have been found in Christ Jesus and we are all these things and we have this great destiny and isn't this wonderful and we will give praise, amen. But they, da 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 Okay, he, John goes, them, us, them, us, us, them, them, us, us, them, 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 us, us. And it's very frustrating, okay? So having told you that it is that way, let's look at it. And first, in John's legal indictment against the unbelieving world, he defines a number of key terms within his writing. I want you to make your key terms first. Chapter 3, verse 4. Next to it, the word unbeliever. 3, verse 4. Everyone who practices sin and also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. The unbeliever is the person who makes up his own rules contrary to the rules of God and abides in his own rules. Let me say it slower. The unbeliever is the one who makes up his own rules in contra uh, contrast to God's rules and then abides in those rules. He's going to talk about the person who practices anomia. No, anomia, lawlessness, means makes up their own rules. It doesn't mean no law. It means they make up their own. So there's a person who he's going to call an unbeliever. And he's going to say that the unbeliever is the one who makes up their own standards of morality. Does that hard for anybody here to understand? Does everybody grasp the concept? All right. Then verse 9, I want you to write the word believer. Believer. That's the one who's born of God and refuses to, to live in rebellion. A believer is someone who's born of God and refuses to live in rebellion. Now, get down to 3, 16 and 17. And next to 3, 16 and 17, love. The word love. And you know what love is. Love is acting deliberately to meet a need because we have a need expecting nothing in return. In Inside the parameters of his word. Actions inside the parameters of his word that are designed to meet a need. Okay? That's love. The self-defining term of love as he uses love. Then go to 15. 315. Murderer. Colon. Murderer is a hater or a jealous person. When he says murder, he means somebody who is filled with hatred and jealousy. Then go down to 324. Abiding in Jesus. The definition of abiding in Jesus is in 324. It means obedient to Jesus. Do not. Do not sit in a Bible study where somebody supplies their understanding of the definitions of those words. Use John's definition or you're going to come up wrong. You're going to come up with sinless believers. <laughs> if he sins, he's... He's not a believer. Well, wait a minute. Ask, what is the definition of a believer in 3.9? And apply the definition to the whole of chapter 3. These are self-defining terms. All right. Now, how to do this, I don't know. But here's what I want to do. In verse 1, 4, 8, 12, and 14 are, no, are notes on not yet believers or them. Let me come back and do that for you. Here's them the not yet believers. Reading verse 1, it says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. 
For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. What is the characteristic of the not yet believer in 3.1? They don't recognize believers as one of them. They see believers as different than them. They don't recognize believers as one of them. They see believers as different than them. In other words, in verse 1, they do not know us, meaning they don't recognize us as one of them. Unbelievers put circles around believers and think something's wrong with them. It's one of the ways you know an unbeliever. They put circles around believers and the things that believers care about and think something's wrong with that. The more someone looks at you and says, I can't, how could you believe this, this, and this that are biblical things? The more you can tell that they're not a believer. Okay? Second, go down to verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Okay, stop right there. What's the definition of sin in verse 4? Okay, but don't just give me the word. What does it mean? The definition of sin is someone living by their own rules. So I put that next to verse 4. An unbeliever lives by their own rules. Everyone who lives by their own rules demonstrates lawlessness. They're living by their own rules. Everyone who practices sin practices living by their own rules. Or everyone who lives by their own rules practices sin. Either way, the equal sign works in both directions. He's not trying to tell you that believers are perfect. He's trying to tell you that the characteristic of a believer is that he follows the word of Christ, and the characteristic of an unbeliever is he makes up his own rules concerning what's right and what's wrong. By the way, you already agree with that. I don't know any believer who doesn't agree with this. Okay? Verse 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Take it apart. The one who practices sin. What is sin? Making up his own rules. The one who practices sin, making up his own rules, is of the devil because the devil's made up his own rules from the beginning. Meaning, from the time that he fell, he's been making it up. He's writing his own morality. And the one who writes their own morality is one of his. Even if they call themselves a priest in a church, even if they call themselves a preacher or a pastor, if you're making up your own rules, you're not following Jesus's. That's what he's saying. And that is the nature of sin. Sin is rebellion. Rebellion is deciding your rules are more important than Jesus's. That's what he's saying. Go down to verse 12, 13, and 14. Uh, go to 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Now, the work, the working out of evil deeds is one of the ways that we see a person who is living in the world in verse 12. But the real problem is they have no place in their heart for you. In verse 13, an unbeliever demonstrates their unbelief by their hatred of those who follow the word of Christ. So ultimately, they're not tolerant. They're intolerant of you. They're going to plead with you to be tolerant of wrong while they're intolerant of right. This is as it was from the beginning. In other words, what does Satan do but introduce himself into your life and say, go ahead, laugh at this. Go ahead, be part of this. Come on, be tolerant. You want to you get along? Live and let live. Now, he's all about live and let live until the truth comes out. Then he's not about live and let live. He's not about tolerance. He's about, you can't say that. So tolerance isn't real. It's one-sided. Now, go back to the beginning of the chapter and let's see what the believer is called. So let's, let's finish with all the yucky stuff and get on to the fun stuff of being a believer. Okay? Here's, the, here's the look of a believer. 3-1. 
See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God and such we are. We are the sons and daughters of God. Believers, number one, are children of God. And, and so we're children of the Creator, but in a very special way. You have to understand the use of the term son here is not the use of the term we're created by Him. The use of the term son here is a relational word. That is, the, who is a son in a Hebrew family? He who does the will of the Father. Okay? You're not a son when you become prodigal. So this is the one who's following. So he says, look at the love the Father's bestowed on us that we would, be, we would be given the opportunity to follow what he says. That we would have that opportunity. We get to be sons and daughters of God, meaning we get to be those who can follow him. Verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. What does that mean? It sounds like legal double talk to me. What does that mean? Okay, take it apart. Start off with, we are his children. We are children of God right now. What we're going to be is not what we are. We are children but we don't look the part yet. How many of you over your lifetime now can see that you're looking more like a parent? I don't mean any parent, I mean your parent. How many of you look in the mirror and you see more of mom or more of dad? How many of you are afraid? Very afraid. You're worried. What he says is you're already children, but you're growing to look like something you don't yet look like. That's what he said. And then he says, when you're there and you see the Father and you see the Son and you see the relationship, you will finally see what you are to become. There's a moment yet to happen in your life. When you see Jesus and the way he deals with his Father, you will become a better believer in that moment. This, the word here is when you see the Son of God in front of the Father, you will know what you are as a son or a daughter to act like, and you will become more of what it is you're supposed to look like. There's a promising day. You're, you're growing toward looking like, you're supposed to be looking like the Savior, but in that way having the Father's resemblance. But one day you're going to see it the way it is. And then it says in verse 3, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. What does that mean? Everybody who is looking forward to becoming what we should be, is already working on themselves to become more like what they already know he is because they see Jesus as a pure reflection of what it means to be a son. So as you're growing, you're becoming Christ-like. That's what he's saying. And then verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Now look at the contrast. The unbeliever is not trying to become like him. They're trying to become more like whatever rules they made up. That's what he's doing. He's, he's, the contrast is believers are growing to be more like Jesus, while unbelievers are growing to be like whatever they've designed for their own sense of morality and, and justice. They're following fervently after something, but it isn't him. Verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Jesus appeared with a purpose that he would break us from sin. Now, what is sin according to the text? Making your own rules. Sin is lawlessness. So Jesus came to break the pattern of men making up their own rules. How did he do that? Not only by dying on the cross for us, but by showing us through his life what the laws were. He came and he said, you heard it said, but I say to you, you missed the point of what I said. I need you to understand what I said so that you can start to, to get away from making your own standards and come over to the standards that I already have. Then verse 6, no one who abides in him sins. Now look at that verse. If somebody comes to you and says, the Bible says Christians don't sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or know him. 
the answer to the question is, what is sin in the passage? No one who abides in him makes up his own rules. And no one who makes up his own rules has truly seen him. They don't know him. So the fork in the road is, are you going to follow Jesus or is Jesus going to be tacked on to your rules? Are you going to talk Jesus and walk your own rules? That's what he's trying to say. And verse 7, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices making up his own rules is of the devil, for the devil has been from the beginning making up his own rules. He's just trying to make sure these two paths are crystal clear to you. Either you're going to follow Jesus or you're not. But you can't claim to be a Christian and not follow Jesus because that's what it means. You are living in a time when, when we can redefine boy, girl, marriage, and Christian. I'm a Christian, but I live like I want. That's not the definition. And God's definitions are fixed. And that's why it's written down. So he says, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. What was that work? Making up his own rules. No one who is born of God practices making up his own rules because his seed abides in him and he cannot make up his own rules because he's born of God. He, make, he follows the family, not his own rules. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So he says, if you're making up your own rules according to what you want them to be, you're not going to love your brother, you're not going to practice what God says is right. That is a definite sign that your fingerprints are you're in that family, not in our family. This is the message which you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another, but not by killing one another. You can go out and say, well, Cain slew his brother, but they were brothers. No, they weren't brothers. He killed them. Because his deeds were evil, his brothers were righteous. One was following God, one wasn't. And they showed it by their deeds, but their heart was the problem already. So in verse 13, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised because you are trying to become like your family and they're trying to become like theirs. They're not the same family. We know that, he ha that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. He who does not love abides in death. All right, what's the life and the death? And we know that we pass from death into life because we love the brothers. He's now doing death and life as division and unity. Before he was doing division and unity as light and darkness. He keeps going back to the same theme that he went to earlier when he said there's light and there's darkness and light binds it together and darkness breaks it. Now there's death and there's life. We're part of life. We're part of light. We're not part of darkness. We're not part of death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I have heard people literally, I, just this past week, somebody wrote to me and said, um, a convicted murderer, can they ever go to heaven? Because a murderer, it says no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. But that's not what he's talking about, is it? He's not talking about somebody who murders. Necessarily, they might have. He's saying, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. That is... You don't hate your brother if you're really one of his. So why is it that eternal life doesn't abide in you? Because you're not really one of his. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He's talking about a time when there's persecution and people are giving up each other to be arrested and others are dying to hide one another. So he says we ought to be willing to lay down our lives. That's how you can tell if you're real. Whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Love has to function in between a believer, the, the believer in need and the believer with what God has given to him. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't tell me how much you love. Show me how much you love. 
We will know by this that we are of the truth, that we assure our heart before him. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. He says, even inside you'll have conviction. You'll know that conviction will come back on you if you don't do those things that God's told you to do. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and are doing the things that are pleasing in His sight. This is the commandment that we believe in the name of, the, of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He commanded us. The one who keeps His commandments abides in Him and He in, in Him. We know by this that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. He is actually making the exact same argument He did in chapter 2. He's saying you will know in your heart because the Spirit is placed in your heart to remind you. And if you allow sin in your life and condemnation and guilt in your life, you will keep wondering if you're really one of His. All right, chapter 4. Um, I, this becomes very complicated if you do not look carefully at the pronouns. This is an argument about different types of people and they're mixed together. We started this in three, but it gets more complicated in four and five. But the issue is this. There's mixture of truth and error. How do we know what's true? How do we know in the church, people professing that they know God, who does and who doesn't? How do we know which one of the components is telling the truth and what people are not? So the way to do this is to start circling pronouns. Okay, let's just see if I can get this to, to, to be clear. The beginning of it is, don't believe everybody. That's verse 1. Test the spirits. Meaning, when you're hearing something, you've got to test for a ring of truth. Don't, don't just believe it. You've got to test it. And then he starts giving you a standard by which you could test it. You know that the spirit is from God if it confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh. What, that, what he's saying is, this isn't the only standard of truth everywhere in all times and all places, but in the contest or trouble they're having in those churches in the first century, there is a problem going on. He's addressing the problem he's addressing, not the one from your church, the one from theirs. And their church had a problem. People were coming and saying, Jesus wasn't in the flesh, that he was a spirit that came, that he didn't come because flesh was degraded and negative and bad and flesh is ugh. And so the only way for this to be a spiritual story is for it to not also be a flesh story. But the fact is, John said, I ate with him. I laid on him. I know him. It was a flesh story. And they're telling you a lie. And I was intimately close with Jesus in talking. We sweat together. We work together. We laugh together. I know it was true. So he says, if a spirit, verse 3, does not confess that Jesus, uh, and, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of Antichrist. In other words, it's not only that he came in the flesh, but that he was God's son. You are from God. So I want you to circle the you at the beginning of 4. You are from God. You have overcome them. Circle them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Circle world and put the them and draw it to the world. So, you're from God. He's greater in you. They are the world. That's the, that's the equation. Now, keep going very quickly because i got to get through this very fast. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world. The world listens to them. The whole point that he's making is that popularity will be much favored on their side because they're part of that group. You are far into that group. And then he stops and he says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God and everyone who, who loves is born of God and knows God. He's not saying everybody who knows how to love is a Christian, nor is he saying that only Christians can love. He's saying in the context of my argument, I want you to love one another because if you show the kind of love that we've been talking about, that is acting deliberately to meet a need because there's a need expecting nothing in return in the parameters of God's word, if you are that person, then you are part of us. You are from God. How do we know? Because you're living within God's word. Who else would do that? 
If we stand together and we love with God's love one for another, we demonstrate or broadcast who God is. And in the day of judgment, it will be clear that we were his because we will be like him in the way that we've responded to one another. The whole point of this is he starts off by saying, test the spirits, let me give you ways so that you can know, 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 know that this person is out of bounds and this person is in bounds, that this is unrighteous, that this is righteous, that this is light, that this is darkness, that this is death, that this is life. And he uses these contrasts to try and say it's not as fuzzy as you think it may seem.